The way you want to think about negatives in terms of climate is climate danger. That's the key concept. And so if you ask what has happened to climate danger in the last hundred years, it's declined precipitously. Today, I sit down with Alex Epstein, author of Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. They very cleverly masked this anti-human, anti-technology agenda. You look at how glorified being green is, but what does green mean? It just means less impact, right? The ideal green planet is the Earth that would exist had human beings never existed. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Alex Epstein, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Hey, my pleasure. Very, very nice location we got here. Absolutely, and uh, very relevant, I think, to what we're going to talk about today. Viewers of this show know that a common mantra of mine is, my goodness, how could the experts have gotten so much wrong over the past few years? It's kind of unbelievable. But you actually, as I read Fossil Future, especially the first few chapters, you talk about exactly how a whole seeming consensus of experts can get things wrong. And I want to start with that. How does that work? I think it's a great, first of all, it's a great question. And it's, it's something I, I has that has really bothered me a lot in my life because I try to always be historical in my thinking. I think there's a conceit that we can have that, oh, everyone else, everyone in the past, they were wrong and they were stupid and they did things like slavery and racism and eugenics, but we would never be that stupid. And what we do is obviously right, and the rest of history will view it as right. And like that doesn't seem very likely, because th that's what the past thought too, right? Even the Germany, Germany when they're voting in Nazism by a plurality, like they're in some way thinking they're right. They're thinking they're progressive in, in the sense of they're forward-looking. And yet, you look back and you see that majorities are very often wrong, but also that them being wrong is often connected to the alleged experts. So it's like, well, these these, these like slavery. Racism, these things are, were viewed as scientific. Uh, eugenics, like they have a, a strong uh, alleged science to them. And so that's, that's scary where what we're told the experts think can be murderously wrong. Not just a little long, wrong, but murderously wrong. And one thing I realized is that a big part of what's going on there is not that these really murderous bad conclusions come from the actual researchers themselves, but it comes from some set of factors distorting uh, the research. That's a really interesting kind of thing. So it's like, okay, well, their, their advances in genetics or something, that doesn't logically lead to eugenics in my view, and, and I don't think in many people's view, but people would distort those. And so one thing I talk about is when we're getting what is considered expert guidance on some issue, it's actually coming through what I call a knowledge system, a set of people and, and institutions that has four main phases. One is the research phase, but then that research to be useful to us has to be synthesized dramatically. And even if all the research is right, which is hard enough in the first place, the synthesis can be way off. And then after that, it has to be further synthesized in what I call disseminated so that it's accessible to somebody who's just reading the paper and has very limited bandwidth. And then the last step, and this is the least appreciated one, is the evaluation stage. So whatever, whatever is the disseminated truth in a field, even if that's true, you could have a totally wrong evaluation. So an example, let's just say you have a disseminated truth that COVID is a new virus and it's you know, significantly dangerous. You know, we don't have antibodies in response to it or whatever. But then people went from that to the policy should be to uh, zero out COVID at all costs like eliminate this one virus at all costs. But whatever the science is, that doesn't follow, right? Because when you're thinking about policy, you can't just think about one virus. You need to think about all the threats to human life and all the potential benefits to human life. So I think COVID is a clear cut case where whatever the science is, you can see how science can be distorted to, for a certain evaluation. And the danger is when people say, oh, well, listen to the scientists or listen to the experts. And what they think is, oh, this zero COVID policy is scientific. And the truth is actually no one science can ever dictate policy. They can just inform policy. So whatever the best science on COVID is, we wanna know, and that's hard enough as, as we've seen in many cases, but we should never make the mistake of thinking that a specific set of experts in a specific field can dictate policy. Policy always depends on multiple fields and it depends on your particular values. And if, you, if we don't keep that in mind, we're gonna do terrible things and think it's the experts. Well, and, and indeed we, 
seen that actually happen, play out in real time over the last few years. And there's this, there's another element. So, you know, you, you have this really helpful and logical breakdown of these points of failure where you go from, you know, actual experts who are doing, many of which are doing, you know, pretty good research to, you know, uh, an interpretation and policy around this research is totally devoid of what the original findings were, or, or largely devoid. There's this other element, and I'm curious how you see how you see this fit into the whole stop climate change at any cost narrative. Is there were actual experts in, in the COVID context who were, you know, trying to get information out that would counter the prevailing narratives and counter the prevailing policies, and they were basically kind of pushed aside or called fringe epidemiologists or whatnot, right? And there's, so this is this other piece. So we, we kind of need, this is, I've been struggling with this. We need experts to interpret things, but it seems like most experts are really failing us, right? Well, yeah, what I would call designated experts. So there's a class of people who are designated as the spokespeople for all experts, and sometimes Sometimes there's somebody like in climate science, there's a guy named Michael Mann, who's an actual researcher in the field. Now, granted, he's got a lot of controversy and I think a lot of problems, but nevertheless, he's a researcher. But then also he is trusted to summarize climate science. And then crucially, he's trusted to make good evaluations of policy, which I argue he does a terrible job at because he totally ignores the benefits of fossil fuels. But you, I think you have those designated experts, but I think part of what the problem is, is we're we need more of a separation between expertise in a given field and then policy. And particularly with policy, we need a very free kind of open debate about things with openness to a lot of factors. So even think about COVID, whatever, because you can stipulate, even if everyone agreed on the science, there's a lot of different views of what policy should be just based on different risk tolerances and all kinds of things. So the, one of the dangers I think we saw with COVID is it becomes so political in terms of people want to have a, a political view that is called the science. And so that, that doesn't, the, as I said, the political view can't follow from the science, but part of what it does is it also percolates into science negatively because anyone in science who's saying anything that would seem to contradict the political narrative is like they become persona non grata. It's no longer, hey, here's a person expressing an opinion, we can take it or leave it. It's this person is derailing my political agenda. And I think that's what happened with a lot of the uh, opposition to like lockdowns. Like anyone who was seen as, well, they're opposing lockdowns, they're a crank. And now I think certain people who were opposing lockdowns were cranks, and I think certain people definitely weren't. And you get the same thing in, um, with, with energy and climate. Like anyone who derails the uh, I forget what you put it as, end climate change at all costs narrative, or you know, what's often called the net zero thing. They're, what are they called? They're called climate change denier, and you shouldn't listen to them at all. And you have this even with recognized prestigious climate scientists who have had decades of experience doing this and have real achievements in the field. So somebody like Richard Lindzen, who, you know, who's emeritus at MIT and was you know, one of the most impressive people in the field for a long time. Like you have Congress people who are just like, oh, that's an idiot climate denier. It's like, wait a second, you know nothing about this field, right? This is somebody who has real achievement in the field. Even if he's wrong, he knows a lot more than you do, but you feel comfortable dismissing him out of hand, you who know nothing. And it's, I think it's because it's become so political. So Lindzen is just viewed as, this is just a guy getting in the way of my political agendas. I think we, should, we need to separate the political agendas. We, we need to just say, we're gonna try to factor in the best science, but part of that is we want a robust debate about politics. And we want to be open to different views um, in science. Although I think in science, there is, there is room. It's important to know what's the state of consensus. Uh, that doesn't mean we should obey it, but you, should, you want to know. But even that needs to be explained very carefully. And one thing I've pointed out is you hear these numbers like 97% of climate scientists agree. And invariably, the, the consensus is distorted to promote the policy. So today, we hear 97% of climate scientists agree. And the actual studies say they agree that we have some climate impact, not at all catastrophic impact. But yet that's interpreted to mean 97% of climate scientists agree with the net zero agenda, which doesn't fall at all. So again, it's the science is being perverted or distorted to advance this set political agenda. Hey everyone, I've got a special announcement. We're launching a Sunday Watch Party series. 
Many of you have told us that you want to share some of our best episodes with your friends and family so they can be more informed about what's going on. So every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll be re-premiering some of our best American Thought Leaders episodes for subscribers and non-subscribers alike. It's free to everybody. And if you have a suggestion for the next American Thought Leaders episode that you'd like to see for our Sunday watch party, or email us at atl at epochtimes.com. I look forward to seeing you all on the live chat this Sunday. I'm going to get you to make your quick case in a moment for me, but there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you. Have you ever thought about how similar this phraseology of, you know, net zero and zero COVID is? Has that ever struck you? Um, I mean, I've thought about the zero in general. I don't know if it's, I mean, they're both bad as a goal, but like net zero is much worse than zero COVID. Okay. I mean, much, much worse than zero COVID. Um, in the sense of zero COVID is all things being equal, that would be something you would want. Like, I don't know many people would say, I'm really glad this coronavirus came along. Like we should have some of it. Uh, I mean, you can say it's, it's not, at the, once, it's, once it's out there, it's not a realistic goal and it's a damaging goal. And I certainly think right. that that's, uh, that's the case. And I think the best people were saying that from the beginning, like this is gonna become an endemic virus. It's gonna be like the flu and, you know, absent some just total breakthrough and vaccination and other things, like this is gonna be with us for a long time and it's gonna be an issue, but it'll be progressively less of an issue as we develop um, immunity. Whereas like net zero, is part of the reason I say it's worse is that, well, I believe pursuing it would be much worse. We'd have to get into that. But I think that trying to zero out our use of fossil fuels or even our emissions from fossil fuels on a 27 year time frame, I think that would be the single, and I mean this literally, I think that'd be the single most destructive act in human history in terms of depriving people of energy and shutting down civilization. But then also I think the reason why it's bad is because net zero climate, it's really net zero climate impact. It's part of a broader movement that says that our impact in general is bad. And this is why I find it so abhorrent. I talk about this a lot in Fossil Future. You, where you there's talk such, about this uh, anti-human framework. Or anti-impact framework. Which I thought was very fascinating. Yes, yeah, so if you look at, I mean, my, my basic premise is that the underlying goal of so much of what's going on with energy and environment is this view that human impact on nature is evil and we should eliminate it as much as possible. And, and that is such, uh, when I was 18, I learned some pro-human environmental philosophy and I, I, I didn't know anything about energy back then. And so I was still afraid of climate catastrophe, but I really concluded that the green movement was anti-human because I realized, wait a second, they're against human impact, one, and two, humans survive and flourish by impacting the earth. So you're against our means of survival. But that's really true. And you look at how glorified being green is, but what does green mean? It just means less impact, right? The idea, the ideal green planet is the earth that would exist had human beings never existed. So we have a very, I believe we have a very deep seated anti-humanism in our culture that's been growing over the past few decades and generations. And that's why I find zero, when you say like, net zero CO2, it's part of a broader thing of let's not impact the earth at all. And, and to me, that's the same as saying, let's have a lot fewer humans. Because if, if somebody said, hey, I'm for zero bear impact, that means you want to kill all the bears, right? And I think it's the same thing. Like to be against human impact is to be against human life. Because again, we survive and flourish via impact. Wow, this is uh, beginning to sound a bit like the depopulation agenda I keep hearing about. Well, it is, it's the underlying idea, right? But it's, it's, and that's sometimes viewed as conspiracy, but if you look at the history of it, this was a very overt belief during the early modern environmental movements in the late 60s and in the 70s. Depopulation, and, and usually put as, well, we have a problem with overpopulation. Well, how do you solve a problem with overpopulation? You depopulate, there's no other solution to it, quote unquote, and that was, a very popular idea, like Paul Ehrlich, his ideas never seem to die, no matter, he's the most wrong person in recent history, just every prediction he makes is 180 degrees wrong. He says the world will end and it gets much better. But he in the 60s, you know, he was on like the Johnny Carson show many, many times, which, and just tell, this was just, that's just considered you're a totally normal person. I mean, imagine somebody who's on, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon and all these different shows. That was just a normal idea, as was, interestingly, anti-technology. So in the 70s, it was quite common for environmental activists to say, we're against technology. And basically what they learned is both of those are bad messaging. 
So if you put it as impact, if you put it as we're anti-population and anti-technology, it's too literal. It's too literally anti-human, and so people pick up on it. But if you say I'm against impact, what happens is impact is a vague term in the sense of it can mean impact can mean impacts that harm us or impacts that help us. So when people think, oh, we want to minimize impact, they just think, oh, we want less air pollution or less water pollution or less unnecessary destruction of natural beauty. You think, oh, great, sign me up, like get me on that minimize impact bus. But wait a second, minimize human impact also means minimize farms, factories, roads, you know, everything that makes the world livable for 8 billion people. And so they, they very cleverly masked this anti human, anti-technology agenda under, oh, let's minimize impact. But that's why I like to take it literally, like, wait a second, we survive by impact. And so what my argument is we should replace this with what, what I call a human flourishing perspective, which is we want the earth to be as good a place as possible for human flourishing, which means we actually, we need to have as much positive impact as possible. We want to mi maximize our positive impacts and we want to minimize our negative impacts. And that's going to allow us to really to have a world that 8 billion people can enjoy, including things like natural beauty and clean air and clean water. And, or possibly, or more, right, I guess. But or more so, than 8 billion? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, but, I mean, we have a lot of deep population problem, um, population reduction problems. Yeah, I mean, my view is there's nothing, I mean, we could easily have twice the population if you have free countries that are allowed to use technology, because the basic elements in terms of, like, food and water, like, we have limitless ability to produce those, provided that we're not restricted in our ability to create value. But the green movement is totally uh, attacking that. Right. Well, so let's take this moment and you know, give me your case, like the sort of the the elevator pitch view version, because your book is, you know, you. I, I'm just going to commend you here. You're an incredibly logical thinker, and you take people through you know, basically all the way from the beginnings of the, the issues with the existing arguments to all the way through to, you know, what, what does a good world look like? What does human flourishing look like, right? Then what, what is a positive vision with fossil fuels? So, but give me your, give me the, the sort of the short version of your argument here. So the, I mean, the, the, so the subtitle of the book is, so it's called Fossil Future, and then Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and natural gas, not less. And so the first part we've talked about a bit, so global human flourishing, but it's important that I'm putting it in terms of global human flourishing because the prevailing way of thinking of it is our goal should be to eliminate our impact in general, but particularly our CO2 emissions. In my view is that is a bad goal. Even if CO2 emissions are like a way bigger challenge than I think they are, it can't be your main goal. It's like COVID, right? It's like even with like, co Eliminating COVID cannot be your main goal. At most, it's an as you know, and it is, it's an aspect of promoting human flourishing. So one is just we should be thinking, if we're thinking about global issues, it should be about global human flourishing. So that's that's a very distinctive thing because my argument is 99% of thinkers on this topic are not thinking in terms of global human flourishing. They're thinking in terms of eliminating CO2 emissions. And my evidence is how many countries have made an energy abundance pledge? How many countries have made a human flourishing pledge? How many, uh, you know, how many companies have? How many financial institutions have? All, all the countries and, and major companies and financial institutions, they all have net zero pledges. So their animating moral goal is no climate impact. And I think, I think the first thing is to step back and say, that's, that's the wrong goal. So absent what, whatever the science is, like the goal should be global human flourishing. Climate is at most one aspect of that. So that's why I stress that. And then when you're thinking about, so I'm saying more oil, coal, and natural gas, not less. And then the next thing I say, I mean, it's a little ordered a little differently in the book, is that if we're thinking about should we continue using fossil fuels, that's oil, coal, and natural gas, should we diminish them, should we increase them, you're looking at it from a human flourishing perspective, and essential to doing that is you need to carefully weigh the benefits and the negative side effects of that. And I argue that in our culture, we tend to only look at negative side effects and not benefits. And that's a terrible, terrible way of thinking of it. So for example, I, I mentioned this guy, Michael Mann. He has a whole book on fossil fuels and climate. But when he talks about food, he only talks about, hey, what are the negative side effects of fossil fuel use on food? 
And that's a fine thing to look at if you're, it's a good thing to look at insofar as you're doing it accurately, which I don't, I don't think he is, but revealingly he has nothing about the benefits of fossil fuels to food, even though fossil fuels literally make it possible to feed 8 billion people because they provide the fuel for all the amazing agricultural equipment, particularly diesel fuel, which is very hard to replace. And also they provide natural gas, which is the basis of modern fertilizer that allows us to feed 8 billion people. So my view is you need to carefully weigh the benefits and side effects. And actually my argument is if you do that, it's pretty obvious that we need more fossil fuels. And the basic reason is the, the benefits of having what I call cost-effective energy, so low-cost, reliable energy that's versatile, it can power every type of machine, that's scalable, that can provide energy for billions of people in thousands of places. That's literally the difference between poverty and prosperity, uh, between danger and safety. Like, when you have a lot of energy, you have an abundant and safe world. When you don't, you have a deficient and dangerous world. So the benefits are so huge. They're desperately needed. So there are 6 billion people who use an amount of energy that we in the US would consider unacceptable. There are 3 billion people of those who are using less electricity in their lives than a typical refrigerator of ours. So you just think about it. the world, energy is so crucial, it's so desperately needed, and then nothing is close to fossil fuels for the next several decades. Fossil fuels are 80% of the world's energy. They're still growing. They're growing particularly in parts of the world that care most about cost-effective energy, such as China, which I just posted on Twitter today, has more coal plants in the pipeline than we have coal plants, period. They have more new coal plants planned to last 40 plus years than we have coal plants, period. Never mind their huge inventory of existing coal plants. So fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective for the foreseeable future. So you've got this thing that's crucial to life. Billions more people need it. Fossil fuels are uniquely able to provide it. And then the final thing, because everyone is concerned about climate, is fossil fuels actually make us safer from climate. They give us an ability to neutralize climate danger. So for example, not just heating and cooling, although that saves millions of lives, but building sturdy buildings using high energy machines, and maybe most significantly alleviating drought through irrigation and through crop transport. Drought is historically the biggest climate killer. It used to kill millions of people a year, uh, like 10 million people some years adjusted for population. Now it's less than one one hundredth of that. So fossil fuels, unlike say a prescription drug where you have benefits and you have negative side effects and sometimes the benefits outweigh them, fossil fuels have this unique ability to cure their own side effects. Because when you have energy, you can neutralize almost any danger, right? So even if we made drought worse in the atmosphere, we could be 10 times better at fighting it because of all the energy that we have. And that's why I think it's, it's obvious, because once you realize how beneficial fossil fuels are, including how good they are at, at protecting us from climate danger, and you realize we've already been affecting the climate for 100 plus years, and we're safer than ever from climate, it it, you have to think of the only way fossil fuels could really be a problem that would justify restricting, let alone eliminating them, is if, is if the climate change just totally changed. Like it went from, oh, it's something we can, we can totally deal with and be fine with, and then suddenly we're going to have some devil climate that just ruins everything. And as I argue in the book, there's no science to support this at all. There's science to say we'll get continue to get somewhat warmer, but we'll continue to master that and we'll continue to flourish if we have the freedom to use fossil fuels. You know, you also make the point about the safety is just that it's essentially fossil fuel use which has which has reduced the deaths associated with you know, these hurricanes or basically things re related to these types of weather events, but which also seem to be declining, not increasing, which is against the prevailing narrative, right? You mean the actual incidents? Yeah. The, well, I think the most important point is the danger is decreasing. So we, we often talk about climate change as this evil thing. And I think that actually reveals bad philosophy because we climate change really means man-made climate change. And what, that mean, what people are thinking is, oh, if we made the change, it must be bad. So this is part of this anti-impact philosophy, or really, I think it's a religion, where it's just human impact is bad. And so climate change caused by humans is assumed to be bad instead of, hey, let's carefully weigh. What are the benefits of warming? What are the harms of warming? What about the greening? And then, of course, what about all the energy benefits that come along with it? So it's just a totally, it's a totally irrational way of thinking about it. The way you want to think about negatives in terms of climate is climate danger. That's the key concept. And so if you ask what has happened to climate danger in the last hundred years, it's declined precipitously. 
And the best piece of evidence we have is that the number of deaths or the rate of death from climate disasters like storms and floods and extreme temperatures and wildfires, that's down by a factor of 50. So that's down 98% in a century. And the reason is because the, the ability that fossil fuels and other technologies give us to master the climate, to neutralize climate danger, those are, that ability is so much more important than any changes in the atmosphere. So sometimes people focus a lot on like, well, what exactly has happened to hurricanes and is there a difference and what will happen in the future? Um, but the truth is that stuff doesn't matter too much uh, compared to the ability to master it. The only way it would matter is if it was a total difference in kind. So if hurricanes doubled in intensity, that would be a huge challenge. But if you look at the literature, there are projections that they'll actually decrease in frequency and then increase one to 10% in intensity. That's not the kind of thing we should really be super focused on as a society. Again, we have 6 billion people who need a lot more energy. Uh, we ourselves could be a lot more prosperous. It's just, it's the wrong focus. And it, again, it shows the culture's not thinking in terms of human flourishing. They're thinking in terms of eliminating our impact. No, I went to a school for my uh, graduate work that had a prominent forestry school there. And one of the th things you learn in forestry classes is that you mentioned wildfires. And you know, basically when you, um, there's always a kind of a fire cycle in any area. And if you stop that fire cycle, you get these big catastrophic fires. You mentioned wildfires. So this is why I think about this. Are wildfires really a result of climate or are they a result of forest management? Or is it a... Well, wildfires, and it depends how specifically you're asking. I mean, in general, they're a result of nature. So they're just a natural phenomenon. But, I'm um, talking about these sort of big, seemingly catastrophic Right, right. So ones, unusually, right? like, catastrophic wildfires or out-of-control fires, I mean, those are, I think if you just think about it for a second, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's bad practices involved because you just think about, I mean, you've studied forestry, so it's easier for you to think about it, but just somebody thinks logically, like, if it gets, if it got like three degrees C warmer, five, like five degrees Fahrenheit warmer, so it's, so far it's one degree C, so about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer, like, is it really possible that the earth is just going to catch on fire and there's nothing we can do about it? Like, is that really likely? And you just think, no, it's not, what actually causes fires? I mean, there are ignition events and then what causes them to go out of control is there's a lot of kindling for them. And so you can imagine, couldn't we rationally manage forests in a way where we would reduce the amount of kindling, including we can build barriers if we need to between well, different areas. And people do this, yeah, I yeah. just might add, right? Right, like, they do this, but, yeah. but, but it's just logically, there's, I just wanna to point to, there's such this, there's this ridiculous fatalism when it comes to climate change type stuff, where people think, oh, we did the wrong thing and the nature's gonna punish us and there's nothing we can do. And I think it shows it has a religious quality. It's like the nature, the climate God is punishing us and we just sort of have to accept it Versus in other realms, we don't. Like, just a little bit of a sidebar, but Eli, I made fun of Elon Musk about this years ago because he's saying we can make Mars livable, but then he's warning that a two degree warming of Earth will be a catastrophe. How does that make any sense? You can make Mars livable, but you're worried, Earth two degrees, we can't handle it? So there's, once you think technologically about the Earth, it's obvious, even if they don't have your expertise in forestry, that we should be able to avoid these fires. And then you look into it, and it's yet yeah, they manage the forests ridiculously. They allow the, what's called the fuel load to build up to these huge levels. They don't build barriers. They don't have, I mean, at least if we're talking about California, where I'm from, there's just no rationality to the management at all. What we've done is we've just created this enormous environmental hazard. I mean, this is, I think, a literal fact. The California forest is the biggest environmental hazard in the United States. And if it were a private company, it would be immediately shut down. But you just have this unlimited source of fire that we just build up. We shut down logging. We don't clear enough brush. We don't do controlled burns properly. But it's totally a man-made thing. And the fact that we're, the fact that we're focused on, oh well, is it, is there a drought? So it's a little bit more conducive. And did we contribute to that? That's a obviously not the biggest factor. And b, it's it's so ineffective, because we have no near-term control over CO2 in the atmosphere. Because no matter what we do, the world is going to increase it. And even if we stop now, CO2 takes a while to leave the atmosphere. So it just really shows, I think, this... It's a perfect example of how people aren't interested in solving the problem. They actually like the problem to exist because it justifies their power and their attacks on various things like capitalism. Hmm. Okay, well, let, let's... Since you mentioned this, you know, let, let's talk about this ideology, or you're calling it a religion, 
that's kind of driving a lot of these policies. So what, explain that to me. So my, I call this the anti-impact framework, and I'll summarize it in one sentence and then we can, we can go into it, but I think it's, the core of it is the idea that human impact on nature is intrinsically immoral and inevitably self-destructive. I think those are the, t the key elements of it. So intrinsically immoral for us to impact nature and then inevitably self-destructive. And so you can see this with the climate issue. Climate change, us impacting climate, which is what it means in practice, like that's viewed as just a wrong thing, which is very odd because if you think about it logically, we would like to be able to change some aspects of the climate. Like we'd like to neutralize, say, Hurricane Ian in Florida, you know, that was fairly recent. But it's noticed that it's just climate change is viewed as wrong. We shouldn't be doing it. It's playing God. It's tampering with nature, et cetera. And then the view is, well, we, so it has a quality of a commandment. Like I think of the environmental religion, its number one commandment is thou shalt not impact nature. And then, and, and really today it's thou shalt not impact climate. Again, that's viewed as the highest goal in all of society is to not impact climate. That's what net zero means. But then notice if we violate the commandment, we get punished. And it's, it's, the world is gonna become a hellish place. And, it's, and notice all the consequences of climate change. They're supposed to be all bad. Like think about how impossible that is just logically. Like how is it that, so what happens logic, what happens physically is we increase CO2 in the atmosphere. That has a warming and greening impact. The warming impact affects other parts of the climate system like storms and you know, other precipitation related things. How is it possible that all of that would be bad for everyone? It makes no sense, right? You're just changing a system. There will be good and bad. And my view is what matters is our ability to, to deal with it anyway. But it shows that it's, it's really viewed as the, like we upset the climate gods and the climate gods are punishing us. It, it does have that quality to it. And the way I elaborated this is the one is the goal is eliminating human impact. So I think that's the goal of the religion or I sometimes call it the framework. And then the assumption, the reason that the view that it's self-destructive, the earth is gonna punish us, I call this the delicate nurturer assumption, delicate nurturer. So the view that earth exists in a delicate nurturing balance, and you've probably heard delicate balance, you hear it in Disney movies, you see it in academic papers. But the three elements I think of the balance are it's stable, so it doesn't change too much. It's sufficient, it gives us enough resources as long as we're not too greedy. And it's safe, it won't endanger us much. And then the view of humans is we are what I call parasite polluters. So we just take from the earth and we ruin the earth. And on this view, our impact is bad. So when the more we impact the earth, the more the earth is destroyed. And that's why you have all these catastrophists predicting the end of the world. And it doesn't happen, but they keep thinking it's right. And it, it has that quality where you have, you know, an end of days view like, oh, like everyone is going to die on this date. And then they don't. But then usually the people who keep believing it for the next date, like if, if they still believe in some, you know, whatever, some guy on earth who keeps saying this, like, and it's similar as we believe in the delicate nurturer. And as long as we believe in the delicate nurturer, we're going to believe that catastrophe is imminent. So it's, it's really, again, we shouldn't impact nature. And if we do, the delicate nurturer is going to punish us. Well, let me, let me ask you about this. You know, one thing that I've been observing and kind of a theme that has come out in all the different areas I cover on American Thought Leaders is kind of the increase of the relativist view of the world and of reality, frankly. And, you know, that reality is purely what I perceive. And of course, there's only so many people that can believe that because, as they say, reality has a way of punching you in the face when you stray from it too much. Right. But um, I'm wondering how much you think that has influenced things, because I kind of, I, I, I see it everywhere, and that's, it's, it's something maybe a little bit different. Than I'm curious how you, because I see it a lot of places, I'm curious how you think of it here, because in, in some ways it presents as the opposite in the sense of there's a dogma element where it's just listen to the scientists, but the scientists are viewed as they have like the pure access to reality. But it's kind of like a religious leader where it's just like they have the access to the deity. So it's like, you know, just listen to Michael Mann. He's the scientist. Just do what he says. So I'm curious what, I mean, I, there are other, I'm curious how you might see relativism. I mean, relativism and dogmatism aren't exactly, they go together in different ways. But. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you my kind of observation in sort of in different areas. Just, you know, people living more and more in the virtual world on screens. Let's say that you know, 
it's easier for me to believe. It's easier for me to just say, this is what I believe and this is reality. If there's, if this way of thinking has kind of crept into my view of the world because it's been, you know, taught in the academy or taught in grade school and so forth. And so, you know, let's take, you know, this idea that if I don't, you know, sh social distance, I'm going to kill grandma or something. There, there's all sorts of these mantras where on the face of it, when you sit down and think about it for a moment, you're like, this is, this doesn't make sense, right? But, and it wasn't like you believed this before, right? This idea just kind of came in. It, of course, maybe it was propagandized quite heavily, but somehow a lot of us accepted it, the very well-meaning people. Right. And this I'm just giving this is one example. But there's a million of them, and especially over the last few years, there's they, it, this kind of thing keeps recurring. You have all these you know, well-meaning people pursuing something that patently on the face of it, when you really think about it logically for a moment, seems kind of absurd. Right. That's what I'm thinking about. It's interesting. But do you think they hold it as yeah, as relativistic? Because it is it is weird where because some there's a certain kind of relativist view particularly on matters of science, where it's just like, nobody knows what's true. And that's, that's, that's wrong. Like there's no knowledge or anything like that. But then, and that has, that has a lot of problems with it. But then there's also just, well, science is whatever the scientists say. And what you really want is, no, no, science is a method. And it's a method we have to get a better and better understanding of reality. And we want to take information or advice, or at least information from people who follow that method. But part of that is they need to explain it to us and they need to respect our independence to integrate that with other things. And unfortunately, I think you see in so many fields, you see either the relativism or the dogmatism. I mean, maybe here's an example in climate that some people, some of your viewers might find offensive. But this view, there's this view of one side will say, hey, the science is settled like we need to get rid of fossil fuels. And so then there's a response that says, no, 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 science is never settled. But I don't think that's a great response because without qualification, it just means, oh, well, we, should, we can't ever know anything. So you can believe whatever you want to believe. It's like you can believe that there is COVID or there isn't COVID. That's okay. Right? And, and that's not what it is. It's that science is not dogmatic and that people believing it doesn't make it true. But, but you can still have progress in science. Like in a sense, you could say, well, the law of universal gravitation is sort of settled science. It's a, it's a dangerous term to put it either way as settled or unsettled. But I think both of the, like the response to people saying climate catastrophe is settled is not to say nothing is ever settled, so I'm not gonna think about it. It's to say, no, actually, this is not settled at all. Like there's no evidence that we have climate catastrophe. We don't have climate impact. And there's certainly no evidence that we should get rid of fossil fuels as a solution to that because the benefits of those are so huge. So it, it is interesting how it's so common to have dogmatism and relativism versus a more objective approach where you really think in terms of scientific method, logical method. And that's what we really need as a culture is a culture of scientists and other experts who explain things rather than try to dictate them. And if you have that, then you you can really make progress. Well, and, and of genuine, I think of it as genuine truth seeking, whether it's, which is really what science is. It's a method to try to get at the truth of a situation and we come up with models and some of them work incredibly well, almost all the time. So we say, okay, that's settled. Um, but then we sometimes find, a, you know, a problem which causes us to rethink the whole thing, right? I, I that, and again, coming back to this relativism th piece, right? I just wonder if we've kind of, a, a whole lot of people have maybe given up on this idea of truth seeking because maybe there isn't truth to seek. That's true, but they also, but I think they've also given it in term, up in terms of, it's just, let's just listen to authorities. They say something this week that they didn't even think last week, right? Which is just, you notice how quickly the dogmas shift. It's just immediately this thing. And there's no recollection of what I believe, but it suddenly becomes my biggest conviction. You even see this with priorities on issues. So it's just some issues in the news, and then this is my biggest priority. I mean, there's the whole virtue signaling type thing, which is just like, oh, well, I'm now, racism is now my life's passion to fight because I saw something on TV. And it's like, oh, or like there's a storm this week. And so now climate change is my focus. And so it's a problem. Global warming, it was global warming at one point, then it shifted to climate change. But this idea, and it's been 
if we want to call it the fat or the, the way you're supposed to think or you're relegated to the margins of society for quite some time. This yeah. one seems to have incredible longevity. What are the things that can kind of truly challenge such a long-standing perception, which you know you argue pretty convincingly is not accurate? I, I'll, that, I'll qualify what? That, that anthropogenic climate change is a cataclysm. Yeah, in, catastrophic. Imminent, imminent cataclysm exactly. or something. Perfect, right? yeah. 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 Well, now you made me think about why is it so enduring, right? which is an interesting thing, because I think part of it is, just to speculate on that, that quickly, I think part of it is it's not, I hate this term, but falsifiable in the sense of even if you make a specific prediction about change and it doesn't come true, you can st you still say, it's such a vague term, you can still say, oh, we had climate change or we had impact. So it's something about, like if you just say, well, the world is all going to end for, from acid rain in this decade, like when, when you just, let's put it this way, when you speculate specific human consequences by a specific date, then that can be proven false. If you just say something vague like the climate is going to change and it's going to be really bad, then no matter what happens, it's easier to claim vindication, which is part of what's happened. You had predictions. It's vague enough and, and you can, no matter what happens, you can sort of say you were right, which because the Greens got burned on so many predictions like, oh, well, England is going to ha not exist mostly by this year. And so they start making vaguer and vaguer predictions. But the other thing is because it deals with our use of fossil fuels and specifically our CO2 emissions, it deals with a ubiquitous aspect of life. And when you, if you're claiming a ubiquitous aspect of life is very damaging, that justifies unlimited control, which was actually part of the appeal of COVID to people, right, is that breathing was considered dangerous. And so you had the right to control everyone's physical location indefinitely. So there was a, you saw that some people loved that idea. And it wasn't just, oh, there's a danger, it's an emergency, let's, let's just everyone sit in their home for a week while we figure things out. It's no, 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 we might do this indefinitely. There was a lust for power with some of the people. So I think it, it has this, you, you can claim to be right even if you're wrong and, and you get to control everything if it's, if it's true. So, I mean, I think the key is just, making the two things. I mean, one is making the distinction between climate impact and climate catastrophe. I think that's a huge one. And then the other thing I mentioned is just is bringing up the benefits of fossil fuels. And another way to think of it is what we should be really thinking of climate wise with fossil fuels is fossil fuels have made the climate far safer. Like that's the real narrative. Like imagine that, imagine somebody just came here from a hundred years ago in a time machine. So like young Jan came, you know, you came here just a hundred years ago. Your, your experience of climate, if you just watched for a year, what happened around the world would be your dominant experience would be, wow, climate danger has plummeted. That would be your overwhelming. I, I guarantee you it would not be the climate sucks now. That would not be your experience at all. I mean, maybe you could tell, oh, it's two degrees warmer or thing, but probably not. Right. What you would see is, oh my gosh, when I was alive, like it was common for 3 million Chinese people to get wiped out by drought and famine. And that doesn't happen anymore or it's common for a few hundred thousand people to get wiped out by a storm, or it would take years to recover from these events. And it's not like that, or a heat wave, you know, could kill so many babies so easily. It's, it's not like that anymore because we have such a mastery over climate. Like that, that's the real story. And I think my focus is let's reframe the whole thing where we're talking about human flourishing and we're talking about both positives and negatives of fossil fuels. And let's tell the true story. So one, one way I put it that's efficient is, Fossil fuels didn't take a safe climate and make it dangerous. They took a dangerous climate and made it safe. And that's, that's the real story. And part of that story is, yeah, we've had somewhat of a warming impact on the climate. But that's only part of the story. And, and often people, they try to deal with things by just reacting to them, whereas often the solution is to reframe them. Well, one of the themes that I keep getting as I was reading your book as we're speaking right now is that we've all like kind of lost this ability to do cost benefit analysis which is exactly what you're saying like the real story is let's look at the costs and benefits and wow do the benefits ever outweigh the costs yeah right and th that's another way of saying I mean you know I think of it as you know weighing the benefits and the side effects and maybe a general thing is you know, I talk about this in chapter 11 of the book, it's called reframing the conversation and arguing to 100. And it's, it's advice on how to talk about this issue, but I hope that other pro-freedom people take it 
on other issues. And, and it's just very quickly, I introduced the idea of arguing to 100 versus arguing to zero. And basically, arguing to 100 means that you, you say, this is my goal. And then you argue that your policies get you to the good goal. So like the net zero people say the goal is to eliminate our impact on climate and the Green New Deal will get us there. Now, I totally disagree with the goal and the policy, but that's a good model of how to fight for things. If, if you disagree with the direction of policy, usually I think it's you should challenge the goal. But usually often what people do, uh, let's just say often, is they'll say, no, I agree with the goal of net zero but the Green New Deal is inefficient, or it's not the right way to get there. And they try to shoot down the Green New Deal. I call this arguing to zero, because they just try to zero out the other person's policies, but they don't challenge the goal. Versus my thing is, no, no, let's, I, I don't agree with net zero as a goal. That's a bad goal. Let's have the goal as global human flourishing, and then let's look at the policies that, if you weigh the benefits and the side effects of the technologies involved, like what are the best policies to get there? And that's why I believe in energy freedom, including freedom for fossil fuels and nuclear and everything else. But I think, I think in general, pro-freedom people need to more, what I call, reframe and argue to, argue to 100. Don't, if the debate's going in a direction you don't want, don't, you should expect that the framing is bad and needs to be changed. Don't just react to the framing and try to come up with a clever way, another clever way to shoot them down. Because even if you shoot them down 100% in one instance, you can't shoot down the direction if they're setting the direction. And that's such a powerful lesson that, you know, looking at the frame and deciding whether that is what actually makes sense in the first place, you know, powerful lesson to carry forward for all of us. Alex Epstein, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all for joining Alex Epstein and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Yanya Kellek.